Good morning. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, scaling, or as I decided, scaling up um, marine sediment transport, and specifically the challenge that I'm interested in, uh, as well as our many other people, is how to go from the sort of some decades now that we've had of local event scale marine sediment transport studies and our understanding of those processes to time scales that are associated with uh, morphologic evolution, uh, human and land use impacts, climate change, strata formation, um, and also larger spatial scales. So there are a number of possible approaches, many of which have already been uh, attempted by various people, and some of which are uh, conveniently represented by some of the clinics that are going on um, during this meeting. Um, there's been a lot of work in enlarging spatial scales uh, through models like um, ROMs and DELF 3D, um, increasing time steps with appropriate model adjustments. I think XBeach is an example of a model that can do that. Uh, a variety of ways of running models for a series of events and then using those somehow um, to develop a distribution. One thing that's common to all of these approaches is that they all depend on explicit representations of the forcing conditions, the waves and the currents um, that drive this system. And there's another class of approaches that are more, uh, I would say in general, simpler time average representations, which include uh, advection or diffusion or advection diffusion type formulations, and that's, I'm gonna focus on that today. Um, solving for equilibrium shelf profiles. Malcolm Scully and Carl Friedrichs have done some work in that arena. Determining an effective storm, like a representative or effective flood. Uh, sometimes it's done in hydrological systems. John Swenson has taken that approach. Or uh, using more geometric models. Um, Mike Steckler has taken that approach. But I'm gonna focus more on a diffusive type of representation. And one of the reasons, I, I did some work on this a while ago, um, got a little bit stalled uh, for several reasons, um, not the least of which was availability of data to uh, do what I wanted to do with it. But then I was also struck uh, by some recent work um, on the terrestrial side, looking at hill slope diffusion. And it's been uh, thinking about that, um, how to re properly represent that. It's been uh, an active area of research for a while. But uh, Greg Tucker, Tucker and Bradley, just published a paper talking about the trouble with diffusion. And uh, F.U. Fufula, Giorgio, and colleagues uh, also published a paper last year, Non-Local Fluxes and Hill Slopes. Some of the conclusions from these papers is that um, GTL is geomorphic transport law. Most geomorphic transport laws are local, like local diffusion, local linear diffusion. But disturbances that induce transport <clears throat> can often produce a large rate, transport over large, much larger distances than a, a local approximation can properly characterize. <clears throat> uh, both papers talk about connections between a non-local uh, diffusion or that kind of approach and some of the non-linear diffusion work that has been done earlier by people like Josh Waring and others. Um, and they both point to promising alternatives to local diffusion uh, approaches, including um, Greg talks about particle-based models, and Effie's paper talks about non-local transport models. So what I was hoping, actually, is by talking about this um, to this audience, I can get some transport of ideas from the terrestrial to the marine environment. So, um, so in order to facilitate that, um, I thought I'd start by drawing some contrasts and similarities between hill slopes and shelves, which I'm uh, a shelf is in some sort of way kind of a hill slope on the margin. Um, and I'm doing this in part just to sort of cast the two problems uh, so that if whatever intuition you might have about hill slope systems, you might be able to think about how transferable it is to the marine environment. Um, so in marine environments, we have uh, multi-directional versus primarily downslope transport. So Currents uh, can uh, drive transport in any direction. Um, 
Rather than a slope-driven system, this is largely a flow-driven system. It's sensitive to depth, but not especially to slope. For the most part, there's an important exception there that I'll mention. Um, sort of the equivalent of maybe a runoff event, um, sort of a high energy uh, episodic event. Um, in this system would be uh, storm-driven waves. The interesting thing about waves is that they produce large stresses, but they're inefficient at transporting mass. So they, uh, they can get things moving, but they can't take them anywhere. Um, the response of currents, which are the primary thing that actually advects material from one place to another, is not especially responsive to storms. And even to the degree that the surface currents might be currents at the, near the bed are often decoupled from the currents at the surface. Um, so in fact, uh, in many systems, actually, the wave environment and the current environment are, are relatively uncorrelated. And um, there's, uh, because of the combination of waves and currents and the difference in the stresses imparted by those, uh, what we find is that uh, when the wave velocities or wave stresses are much larger than those of the currents, we can actually get near bed um, stratification at the top of the wave boundary layer that essentially caps the amount of material that can get into the water column. So um, it, it's not the case that the larger the wave event, the more material necessarily that you, or you, you can't disproportionately put more material in suspension. There's some uh, self-imposed limits on the system. Um, in this case, we have uh, river mouths, which serve as uh, point sources, upstream point sources for sediment, um, which are active during floods. Uh, almost all of the material delivered to the shelf comes from these. Um, the floods uh, that deliver the sediment and the waves that are able to mobilize the sediment may or may not be uh, correlated with each other or, or uh, synchronous in time. Um, sediment availability on the shelf, despite the lack of vegetation and um, large expanses of open sediment is, uh, for the most part, supply limited, owing to consolidation of the fine grain sediment um, and to uh, prevalence of small scale bed forms that limit the active layer depths even in the sandier part of the system. Um, and then there, uh, there, are these, there are occasional gravity flows um, that are slope sensitive. They're, they can occur when you have a large input of fresh sediment and waves uh, at the same time that can trap a lot of sediment in the wave boundary layer and that can actually um, move um, under the force of gravity. Um, we call those wave supported gravity flows. Uh, Carl Friedrichs and um, Malcolm Scully have worked a lot on that problem. So that's a process that would not be amenable to a diffusive type representation. So um, one thing that we can't get away from when we think about marine environments is that um, we have three basic sources of fluid motion that all have to be accounted for. Waves uh, that control the timing of transport uh, through most of the, um, certainly most of the shelf uh, and many other even shallower systems. Uh, currents that control the direction and the vertical distribution of flux. And tides, which are uh, an ever-present source of variance and turbulent mixing in these systems. All of those, oh, actually, let me just, sorry, back up and just, uh, this is just an illustration, some measurements from Northern California. These are um, low frequency currents uh, and their direction, uh, hourly currents showing tides, bottom wave velocities showing sort of uh, wave events. These are the shear velocities due to the waves in blue and the currents in yellow and the resuspension. You can see very clearly that the resuspension events are highly correlated with the wave events. Um, and then uh, all of those combine to affect the magnitude of the flux. The flux is shown here in red. And there are definitely times when you have um, waves uh, putting material in suspension, but you don't have, uh, the currents aren't very high, and therefore you don't have very much flux. And there are times when the currents are large, but there's very little material in suspension, and therefore you don't have flux. You really need both. 
um, and there's no way to get around that. Um, as I said, the volume in suspension is limited um, to a, a relatively thin layer of active material near the bed surface. It's on the order of generally of millimeters. Um, and we're able to do a pretty good job representing these processes um, on the short time scale with a, a variety of models. Actually, up here, there's some, uh, the lighter color are calculated concentrations, and the red and the gray are measured values. And in general, um, we, do reason, we can do reasonably well. So the question is, how can we combine, say, all of those things, the waves, the currents, and the tides, into something that's like a diffusivity? And um, it's important to capture all of those effects. We're going to expect that the diffusivity is going to be a function of depth because of the depth dependence of the wave energy at the seabed. Um, one of the reasons I've been interested in this um, is because when you try to characterize, say, the sediment transport potential in a marine environment, it's a little hard because it depends on the wave environment and the current environment and the sediment environment. And one of the things that um, intrigues me about the diffusivity idea is that maybe it's like a single number that you can use to kind of represent all of those things together. Um, but we'd need to be a, combine that with some sort of a advective flux um, to get the whole picture. Okay, so the way that I approached this was kind of a standard random walk type approach. I picked, um, I, I did this for sites where I had a, a long record, at least a decade long record of wave conditions. Um, and here, for example, in Northern California, this just shows the probability of um, the wave uh, velocities or stresses at the seabed exceeding certain thresholds. But the, basically, the top of these bars is uh, the threshold of motion. And this is as a function of depth. So in shallow depths, 20 meters, um, that's exceeded about 90% of the time. But when you're out past 100 meters, it, it's very seldom. Um, and then also at least a year's worth of currents. So what I did was I just picked two week long sections, random uh, sections of currents, uh, took out the mean, and then said that a particle moves with the current uh, at that time as long as a randomly chosen um, value from the probability distribution of waves at that depth uh, says that um, that the threshold would be exceeded. And so as the, as the particle progresses along shelf, it doesn't change in depth, obviously. But as it goes across the shelf, then it becomes less and less likely to move. So just as an example, um, I started 500 particles initially at a depth of 60 meters, uh, followed, allowed them to move for a period of 14 days. And these are the kind of distributions that I get. So, you know, it looks kind of like the standard thing that you'd expect for a diffusive system, relatively, at least in the Kroshoff case, uh, relatively good approximation to Gaussian distribution. You can see that there's a tendency, especially in the long shelf, for them to be uh, peaked or uh, uh, higher kurtosis than you'd expect from a, random, uh, from a regular normal distribution, uh, presumably due to the distribution of the currents. Um, if you do this across the shelf um, I, for different water depths, uh, we do get a decrease in the standard deviation of those distributions, which is related to the diffusivity, like we'd expect. And some kind of patterns of variation in the shapes of the distributions, um, which you know, might merit some more attention. Um, so I did this for a few sites, um, just to see kind of how, what it can tell us about the difference between sites. So this is the eel shelf uh, in Northern California. It's a relatively energetic site on the California margin. This is at 60 meters, kind of mid shelf, and 90 meters on the outer part of the shelf. And then compared to a site in Southern California, um, the Palos Verde shelf near Los Angeles, this is a fairly sheltered area. The wave environment's not nearly as energetic, and you can see much smaller. So these are the diffusivities calculated from the standard deviations. Um, 
more than an order of magnitude smaller at the same water depth. And comparing the eel shelf to the Russian River shelf, which is about 300 kilometers to the south, again, a, a much smaller, um, here about a six times smaller um, value of the diffusivity. So you could ask the question, well, are those numbers even meaningful? And in a rare bit of fortune, um, it, it happens that there is a period of time when there are measurements of waves and currents available for both the eel shelf and the Russian River shelf. So these are uh, based on time series. Um, this is showing uh, currents, uh, the filtered currents to show kind of the uh, lower frequency direction and magnitudes. The wave velocities at the bottom, uh, concentrations 30 centimeters above the bottom, and then the calculated fluxes. So one of the interesting things that we can do in this case is we can sort of parse apart how important different contributions are to the total flux. So the total flux on the eel shelf is about four and a half times larger than the total flux on the Russian river shelf for this exact same period of time. About 55 to 60 percent of that is actually due to differences in tidal conditions. Um, 15 to 20 percent due to differences in subtidal currents. 15 to 20% due to differences in waves, and 5 to 10% due to differences in the sediment conditions. So basically, 60, uh, set, yeah, 70 to 80% due to effects of currents, and, um, and a smaller contribution due to effects of waves. Maybe not surprising. I mean, these aren't that far apart in the wave environment. You can see there's a, a lot of correlation in the waves at the two sites. It's just that the waves are a little smaller at the Russian River site. Well, so how does that compare with the diffusivities? So what I did was I took um, the measurement, the values or the runs that I had already done for the eel shelf and the Russian River shelf, uh, these are at 90 meters, and I swapped the currents. So I have the waves on the eel shelf with the Russian River currents and the waves on the Russian River with the eel river currents. And what I find is that if I do that, um, the diffusivities are reduced, actually in both cases, by about a factor of four. So there's a total of about a factor of six difference in the diffusivities. That means about two thirds of that difference can be accounted for by the waves, uh, by the currents, which is actually very similar to what I got from that specific representation. So I think that there's some sense in these, that is the, you know, in a relative sense anyway, it's telling us something meaningful about how things are varying across this, at different points along the shelf and also across the shelf. We could also think about effects of grain size, obviously finer sediment, and that's what I've been showing you, um, which is primarily what's in suspension there. will have much larger travel distances and therefore diffusivities than if you go to fine, very fine sand or even medium sand. So that's just the diffusivity. If we want to actually talk about the effects on the morphology, then that has to be applied to some sort of concentration gradient to get a flux, and then the divergence of that flux would, will give us erosion and deposition. Um, what I've done is to um, have the diffusion act on essentially the sediment available in the active layer. Um, that's either controlled by uh, wave ripples uh, and their transport rate in shallow water uh, shallower water where the sediments are sandy or by the consolidation state of the bed in deeper water um, where the beds are muddy and we have a, um, only a certain amount of sediment that would be available at any given stress. So what I did is I took um, a representation, kind of a typical representation of um, well, what, actually, let me just back up and say that both of these things, the thickness of both of these layers depends on the excess shear stress, the difference between the stress applied by the flow and the critical shear stress for the sediment. Um, so taking a reasonable uh, cross-shelf range of values for that um, to get a variation in the active layer depth, I applied the diffusion to it. I started with an initial linear slope, and I get something like this. I mean, the shape is reasonable. The, here, um, the rates are very high. And essentially what happens is that because there's a, a lot of the diffusivity is high in the shallow um, parts of the system, it's very easy 
to move all the sediment that's available, um, and that gets moved over, you know, transported down slope, deposits somewhere. So you have a high erosion rate here. And essentially, the, mag the size of that, the magnitude of that erosion is going to be completely determined by how much sediment's available. So if I have you know, a layer like this, it's only three millimeters uh, deep at, um, in the shell part of the system, I can easily remove all that material. And then what happens next just depends on how long it takes for that to, um, to reset or to um, uh, you know, go back to its initial uh, sort of configuration that um, we started with. So we can think of that as like a recovery time. Um, it, that first simulation, I was letting that reset every two weeks. Obviously, the less often I allow that to happen, the slower this process occurs. Well, the kind of uh, obvious major weakness in this approach, because we don't really know very well uh, what those reset times are, but it also actually highlights kind of a more fundamental problem, which is that, um, that those active layer thicknesses and the frequency at which uh, these events happen and the reset times are all tied to that wave environment, the wave and current environment that I was using to calculate the diffusivities to begin with. So, um, so what that suggests to me, and this is a kind of, I think, Greg Tucker's message in his paper, is that rather than sort of go through this step of calculating diffusivities and then calculating um, changes in morphology, maybe it'd be better to just like have the random walks move mass around and just do it that way and, and then have everything um, kind of all part of the same set of conditions. Um, so that's, uh, that would be one, um, one thing, obvious thing to, um, to think about and be interested in um, sort of experiencing people working in terrestrial systems on doing that kind of, um, taking that kind of approach. Um, one thing we could build into that, which wouldn't be too hard, I think, would be a, a trigger for some sort of cross-shelf advection by wave-supported gravity flow. So you might be able to fold everything um, into one big picture where we have occasional, during flood events with high waves, we have the capacity to get these very turbid layers that can move under gravity, and otherwise we have a more diffusive type transport system. Um, another uh, possible next step would be to, even apart from the morphology, just to think about what the diffusivity says about transport potential. That requires spatial wave current and tidal time series, and that's kind of where I had gotten stuck before to actually getting good tidal time series. Um, but you could ask some interesting questions um, about the spatial variations in that and also how those affect sediment redistribution on the shelf. Um, there are a lot of spatial data available. For example, um, NOAA has an operational wave model that gives, can give us spatial wave fields. That's what I'm showing here. This is the forecast, actually, for Monday. You can see on the West Coast, a lot of variation in wave activity. Um, we could use something like ROMS, probably to get the currents, and um, the Corps of Engineers ADSERC model, at least for the US, to get the tides at this point. And, um, and we could also think about um, sort of either in the particle uh, base model or in the diffusive uh, morphologic change model, um, effects of textural variations, flood deposition, you can put in a pulse of sediment, look at the redistribution of that, um, effects of consolidation times and all those on fluxes. And in honor of the person, the talk on geostatistics, I just want to say, well, it's not that that's never entered our realm. So I worked on a project uh, with Chris Sherwood and some other people um, in Southern California where we actually used geostatistics to try to get some detailed information about erodibility on the bed. Um, in many cases, it may be our knowledge of the bed that's going to be the ultimate limitation in our ability to sort of predict morphologic change. Um, so this is kind of one interesting possibility for uh, a way to get denser information. And, uh, well, there, okay. Um, so, 
there are a lot of ways you could approach this problem. Um, I think this idea of diffusivity or, or particle-based model seems to have some, offer some uh, interesting opportunities. Um, still somewhat limited by the shortness of available forcing records. Um, and we still need to know more about the small scale processes in order to be able to really think about these larger scale issues. So, thanks. We still have time for a question. Or? Could you step to the back microphone? Could you go to the microphone? Um, my name is Wen. I'm from University of Maryland. Uh, just a simple question. I'm curious. What is the mechanism for the uh, recovery of the uh, uh, active layer? thickness so that you have to reset them periodically? What is resetting it? So yeah. Well, I'm, you know, that's a good, some combination of probably uh, flow-driven small-scale particle motion plus wave pumping, biological activity. Um, you know, I, on some time scale, we know that you go from that sort of over-consolidated condition back to kind of a, a more normal um, consolidation state. Um, but exactly how that happens, um, at least I don't know in detail. OK, thank you. Um, so I'm more familiar with the uh, land surface and not submarine, so I apologize if this sounds really simple. But I do, um, from when looking at uh, surface processes models, and we have the same problem, although we have a lot of equations, we still don't really know the details, as you know, and but we still want to apply them to understand how landscape have, have evolved, right? And so one of the things that we do is we just kind of assume these limited models work and then try and constrain things. So I'm wondering if you could take the same approach in your problem, because you showed the example where, okay, you have this you just assume this diffusion model, right? And then you have to have this resupply of sediment in order to get um, kind of the right shelf configuration, if I understood correctly. So can you turn that on its head and say, well, that tells us something about that we have to be getting supplied enough sediment um, in order to get a nice shelf configuration? Um, or could you, is the, is the um, problem such that you could tweak your diffusivity so that you would get a nice shelf configuration regardless of how much sediment, how often you were refeeding that active layer? I don't know if that yeah, makes no. sense. <clears throat> I understand, and I, you know, I know that uh, like Effie's done some work where she's backed out of the morphology, kind of what the effective non-local diffusion would have to be in order to produce that, and I, that's an interesting possibility, but one thing we don't know yet, for example, is what the balance of diffusive and advective transport is. And you can also develop those shapes, as um, Carl and Malcolm have shown, from this gravity-driven kind of flow process. So we might be over-interpreting if we were to take the morphologies that we have and then assume that those were formed by these more diffusive processes. We don't actually know but it's still something we hope to be able to address sort of what the balance of the more advective processes and the more diffusive processes are. And then, and then if you really talk about longer time scales, then you have sea level kind of confounding everything a little bit, so. Thank you.